<laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Let's see, just a couple, a couple of announcements. Uh, we have uh, ladies' Bible study this uh, coming Tuesday. Uh, but then on the Tuesday after, on April 4th, there will be no Bible study taking a break. And then for prayer at the church, uh, the, the next week, next week and the week after, uh, I'm going to be out of town, Bill's going to be out of town, so that's it. The whole thing's going to fall apart and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Craziness, but uh, no, yeah, please... Uh, we won't be doing a normal prayer, so you won't see the prayer request necessarily coming out. But as always, it, there's plenty to pray for. You can go back to what was there before and just pray for the church, pray for everybody, pray for me, pray for you all, pray for Caleb and Sarah. Just, you've got all sorts of stuff to pray for. Uh, so there you go. And, uh, and other things to pray for. Let's see, uh, Juanita, you just put up some stuff for the Royal Family Kids Club back there. And those are like, if you don't mind me saying, those are like different positions that are open for the summer camp coming up. Yes. Okay, so definitely take a perusal back there. Is there a time frame for signing up on those, some of those things? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. So. Um, because training is going to start soon and then camp is in July. Yeah, camp is in July. Training is going to start soon for that. So if you're interested, and take a look at some of I, I really like that. That's a really good setup back there. So. Take a look at that. They are always needing volunteers. I've already had somebody tell me that it's like, boy, we need some. They need some guys there, so you know, I might be able to have the opportunity to do that this summer. So that might be fun. We'll see. Yes. The big thing about going to camp is that makes you eligible to be able to participate in the mentoring program. Uh, so so there'll be some hear that. Things. So if you if you help out at the camp, that's like the gateway to. Uh, Helping doing further mentoring programs for the foster kids. So, all right. There you go. Did I, did we miss anything? So. The only thing is, don't keep the information to yourself. Tell your friends because uh, even if you're not available, maybe somebody you know is. There you go. All right. So yeah, it's a spread the word kind of thing is that for that uh, for that opportunity to be able to bless the foster kids. Is there anything else going on? We need to be aware of. Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's pray then. Father God, we just pray now as we get ready to uh, come before you to worship you in the word. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, uh, just move in our hearts and souls, open it up, let us understand uh, a very familiar story, Lord, once again, and to take a, have a, you know, just a, a refreshed understanding. Doesn't mean necessarily we're going to get some fantastically new insight, but Lord, I just pray that for what's there, that what we need to know, Lord, that you would share it to us again and, and make it new to our hearts. And uh, Father, I especially pray for this one, it's because it's so easy, uh, and in prayer time we're talking about it, it's so easy to like, well, that was them. That's what they would do. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts to remind us what we could do. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 11. You guys blink, you missed chapter 10. Just a pshoof, shot through, did the genealogy on that one. It was kind of fun to do that one. But now we're coming to the, 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 the Tower of Babel. I've called this one Distrust of God. Could have called it Tower of Babel Part 1. But I was like, let's use, let's, let's use some imagination. <laughs> like, try to think about these things. And, and this is a great part of the uh, uh, passage of Scripture. Some levels it's straightforward. But I think for me, one of the things that I've always looked at is like, okay, they're, they're, they're about ready to build a tower and such. We understand that. Everybody's familiar with that story. But I've always been like, well, God, why was... Why were you so upset about this? What was going on? What was happening that he would take the radical measures that he did to, uh, to change human condition, if you will? Uh, why would he do that? And so uh, the, 
the big idea here is, you know, instead of trusting God's commands and promise, the people found reasons to disobey and to, to, to de defy God, to do something different. You know, and these folks we're going to see today that instead of listening and remembering God, they chose to rely on themselves instead of God. Can anybody identify with that at all? <laughs> they were worshiping themselves instead of God. Now, a lot of people, a lot of Christians would say, well, what do you mean? I would never worship anybody else, anything else. But we have to remember there's the idols of our hearts. The things that we give our hearts to and the things that we give our minds to, to do instead of God or to do in place of God, that's worshiping another God. And, and, and then also they chose to try to save themselves, to save themselves from God. It's kind of interesting. So as we proceed, I just want to remind ourselves of the good things God had told them to do. You know, we come to the command, the command of promises that God's given them in Genesis 8, verse 16 through 17. He says, this is God, he says, tell them no one's family, he says, go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that's with you, and all the flesh, birds and animals, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So that's like he's like, head on out. There it is. It's all out there for you, ready to go. And so that was his, uh, both a command but of a promise to at the same time. It's like, this is what you're going to be able to do. And so, and they were also given the promise of God's grace that the world would not be destroyed by flood. And Genesis 9 11, it says, I will establish, make it happen, my covenant, my promise to you. That never again shall flood, all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. So there again, God telling them, I'm not going to do that. But that seemed to, that both of these seem to be the very things that they work against in what they do. So, come out of the mountains. Genesis 11 verse 1, he says, Now the whole earth had one language, and the same words. Of course, we all know. If you know the story, it's just like that's all going to come up again. The same. Uh, but it's very interesting that common communication is, is important for so many different things. That's, I mean, when you go to a marriage seminar, what is the biggest thing? Every, they communicate about communication almost the whole time. That's uh, what it's all about. It's, everything is about communication. Uh, <coughs> Working together, and of course, this is that they had one language. Now we don't know what this language was. Somebody's using Morse code over there. We can tell <laughs> through the wall, but then we don't know what this language was. It wasn't Hebrew, so a lot of people like imagine like, like Hebrew was like the ubiquitous language. No, it wasn't. It, there was language a little bit before that. That's why even much of what the Hebrew language was written from how Moses and Joseph work through the Egyptian language to help generate what would become Hebrew down the line. A very interesting uh, idea to know about. So it's like, but they had one language. For all we know, that one language may be the language that everybody speaks when we get to heaven. We don't know what it was. Perfect expression, great language. It's, it's kind of interesting in the sense that they use the same words. And uh, I was looking at some research I'd heard about this, but uh, as of 2012, so this is a few years back, about 10 years ago, uh, at that time, the, the, uh, the international language of commerce was English. Was, uh, you know, still, generally, everybody operates on English and as, as a one language around the world. And um, air traffic control, which I will be highly interested in tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, it's all done in English. That's a, you know, it's a, they don't always speak very good English, but it's all done in English around the world. So it's just like you know, especially international flights. So it's just very interesting. And of course, down the line, hey, if Lord tarries and we're still here, that might the language might be replaced with something else. Uh, but it's still it's amazing to know that 
they use this language. They use America, the, the English language, which is kind of funny because it's like the worst language of the world. And we know this. And I, of course, it's always fun to see examples. And I got some some here today. So we got some some of these same words. So we've heard of the word uh, to bow. Of course, there it is. To bow is to bow down. You know, show respect. But it also can be bow to tie a bow. It's the same spelling. Or it can be a weapon that's used to launch an arrow. All the same word. Thanks, English language. Then we got. Lead. The next one, go ahead and do the next one. Lead is that person in charge. It also is a clue that provides a direction. Mm -hmm. Got a lead going there. Or it can be led. Uh, uh, that's always one of those ones. How, do, why do, how is that? I don't even get it. Then we got our next one, which is similar to bow. It's row. Row of chairs. Row your boat. Oh, go back. Or you can have a row. Yeah. You get a row where somebody's arguing together. Again, and it's like, so, why, why is English this way? It's because English is the mutt language of the world. It truly is. It, we are, it's an amalgamation of a lot of different languages. And it's, this happens even in other languages. I loved it when we, were, when we went to Russia because you would be able to see when we went to McDonald's, even though all the words are in Russian, it says the exact brand names. It's a Big Mac in Russian. You know, it's just like it's using the same word. And they will use those words. I love it. You know, it's just like, you know, when you think of Spanish, you know, it's just like everybody jokes. It's like, oh, I'm looking for, oh, you're going for the bathroom. It's like, uh, Casa de la Pepe, you know, just like, which is wrong. It's, it's the El Baño. That's what it's supposed to be. But uh, in Russia, if you're looking for the bathroom, you ask them, hey, where's the toilet? <laughs> and they use our word for what, the, what they want to use to explain it. And so, and so it's just amazing that really around the world, even everywhere, you know, if you call, some, uh, call a friend in Japan, if you had a Japanese friend and called them, they would answer the the phone, hello. If they, even if they didn't have caller ID, didn't know who was calling, they would say hello. And then, if, they, if but if they were calling somebody else and they knew it was more formal, just maybe not so much a friend, they would say Ohio. That's how they would say it. Or if it was a formal greeting, it'd say oh, Ohio, Kosimas. Just like, and there they go. So that they're saying the same thing, but they still use the word hello. Thank you. That's uh, that's our contribution to world culture. We, we, and, and around the world, the hello has almost become a ubiquitous term for answering the phone. It's amazing. But it's just, that's that amalgamation of many languages that make English language both wonderful yet very difficult to try to understand. And so these guys, they get down and they have all these same language, same things going on, same words. Of what was their main communication? What were they doing? What was their idea, their plan? Well, the first thing was to get, get some place to grow some food. They were up in the mountains. That's where they apparently were at one time. They we're not given the exact timeline here, but you can't grow anything. I mean, I've seen the movie Shark, Sergeant York. His whole, his whole deal was, I gotta get to me some bottom land, you know, just like, and, and that's where you can grow things. So that's exactly what they did. It's gotta get out of there. Genesis 11, two says, and uh, as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. So the land of Shinar, we got a map up, up here. Here's Shinar. It, Shinar literally means the country of two rivers. And of course, you see the two big rivers there. That would be the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Go ahead to the Persian Gulf. Oh, go back, go back. You advance. Yeah, stay right there right now. <laughs> that, that went well. He's like, move fast, move fast, go. So uh, this place, of course, is where the Empire of Babylon would eventually be. In Abraham's time, it was the Ur of the Chaldees, is what it was called. And of course, now you can do the next one. It is called, very famously, this is the Fertile Crescent. And that, that whole river valley there is where a lot of stuff was grown. And you'll notice over in Egypt, you got the Nile River Valley there. That, was, of course, became, as when we went through Daniel, that's where... 
you know, we talked about the political importance, especially for the, uh, the Empire of Rome, that the Egypt became their breadbasket, you know, because of how much food they could grow. And so, uh, pretty amazing there. So, so that was where they came down from. Now, you'll notice there, as I mentioned last Sunday, the details that they, they traveled, mark, migrated from the east. So let's, here it is. So I did the map here. Modern Mount Ararat is, is positioned up there. And, uh, but it says they migrated from the east. So it's highly possible, because if they migrated from the east up there, they would just continue over to Turkey. But throughout that whole mountain range is really the Ararat. And Ararat is actually the word also when nowadays we have what's then called Armenia. Uh, Armenia is actually related to that term. So right in that area, if you will, uh, some of the locals, they'll call that whole mountain range the Ararat mountain range. So there it is. Adds further mystery to well, where exactly is Mount Ararat? Where could it be? It might not be where everybody thinks it is. And I still suppose that if somebody went to go look for the ark, they would never find it, as far as I'm concerned, because they needed building materials and firewood. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> there it is. And what's great is that firewood would have, would have been like those great eight-hour logs that they would have found at, at, the, you know, at the hardware store because it's covered with pitch and stuff, so like light it up, and well, look, it burns a long time, you know, and so there you go, so anyway, it's just some uh, food for thought, uh, I bring up this also because in Genesis 8, 4, uh, Genesis 8, 4, it says, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the, not the singular, but the mountains of Ararat, and so that brings, you know, as they, and, uh, you know, it is plural, plural in, in the Hebrew, so it's not singular and then translated as plural. So in other words, possible that they, Mount Ararat is not the Mount Ararat we think it is. So it's, it's something to think about. So they come down out of the mountain. I still think it must have been amazing to come out of there at that time. Because you have to imagine you're coming out of the mountains and you look out on this valley. You know, it, it just must have been a tremendous thought that nobody was there. This is all, all their place to go plant and live and do everything else. It was all open for them. And it just, it's just stunning to think about. That's one of my favorite things to do. And I definitely urge you to do it when you do your Bible studies is to try to get into the people's shoes. Contextualize it for yourself. Just to say, just to think what they were, would see, what they would do in this situation. So they're coming down and they, they see this. But it's kind of interesting what they did when they got there. Genesis 11, 3. They had to trust themselves because they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. So they, what's going on here? Obviously, I'm, I'm going to believe they've already been planting. that. that, that so God just kips past the story on that. Because they would have been there a long time. You know, as I suggested, probably about 199 years. <clears throat> so we don't know when this process started. But they, they're going to burn bricks. Now, normally, uh, you can make bricks by just sun drying them. That is still the way many people still do it today. They will su just cut out a, a, a special little uh, you know, pattern, they'll fill it up with clay or whatever their thing, and then uh, let it sun dry, pull, it up, pull off your, uh, your pattern, and then just let them dry out there, and then you got bricks. Ready to go. Uh, of course, as uh, in ancient Egypt, they would add straw to give it the, the extra tinsel strength. Uh, but also, they would still sun dry them. But these guys did something different. They said, no, we're going to burn them thoroughly. Which means that they were making them extra durable. So that's, that's a clue to what's going on here. They're, 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 what they're building, whatever they're going to build, they want to make sure that it stays around, that it can endure whatever it gets 
thrown against it. Kind of interesting that, the, you know, even remember, all of you guys are familiar with the book of Daniel. Remember when uh, Rakshak and Benny got in trouble? What they were going to do with them? They were going to throw them into a furnace. So that became part of their culture. That They, they, they used furnaces all the time in the Babylonian area to do the same thing they had done before, to make bricks. So that was all part of their culture. And so compared to trees and everything else that you could use to build stuff with, this is going to last a long time. In fact, you know, as we'll take a picture a little bit here of uh, what they built, uh, that in its own right, the bricks that they found around there were used and reused several times over. So there's still buildings out there that they used the bricks that they made back then almost 4,000 years old. So they're still, that's how usable they are. Um, but it's always interesting, you know, whenever somebody wants to make something last, they'll put it on stone. You know, that's our phrase all the time. It's like, oh, is that written in stone? You know, it's just like, so it speaks to permanence. And so that gives us that tone, what they're aiming for. They talked about, again, at the... Verse 3 again, I'm point out that they brick for stone. They had bitumen for mortar. The bitumen, that's the, the word that they would have used. Also, remember when Noah said he was building the ark and they put pitch all over everything? Well, they, they used the same word. It's bitumen, it's mortar. It could have been something else besides that. But that's just a word. It is, the word also means slime. <laughs> it's like slime or whatever. It's, just the, it's the stuff that they put in between the bricks to make them uh, glue together, if you will. So, again, it's all that they weren't just stacking the bricks. They were making it as permanent as they could in that time. But what was going on? What was their motivation? Why, why were they doing all these things? Well, we get to you know, verse 4. It just lays it all out for us very well. So, Genesis 11, 4. And then they, then they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city. And a tower with its top to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So here we are. We're given three reasons of what they're doing. That they're they're doing a city and a tower to the top of the heavens. Something about that. They have a they're gonna make a name for themselves, building up a reputation, not to be dispersed. Hmm, what's that about? So first, let's take a look at this idea of the city and the tower to heavens. Now, when we're thinking about why God was going to do something, the problem with this is self-reliance versus God-reliance. That's what happens when they're building a city and a tower. It's about self-reliance. They're going to, and part of the phrase is that we're, they're going to build <coughs> ourselves a city. Remember, the first city was done by Cain. That's an interesting remark. It's not remarked about what. Seth or Abel did, Cain was the one interested in building that city, building something permanent, building something that will last and endure what the world would bring. And so they're gonna gonna do this, and it's remember it's like this if they had second generations, likely at this point, if they start building the city, I figure at the second generation mark, they would have had uh, maybe two hundred and some odd people to begin building the city. So I don't know exactly when they started. It says that build a city, and to, when we build a city, is to build a wall. Let's face it, they don't know anything about like, hey, let's have a, a, you know, the government building over here. They're not thinking about those things. Maybe they're thinking about a, you know, a city hall, maybe at best. They're, they don't have a post office yet or anything like that. Like, so essential government buildings are not an answer. But, but maybe that tower, to have a function. Maybe the tower is going to function about worshiping something. Going to, going to show something that where we're not going to rely on someone anymore. And of course, when you build yourselves a tower, uh, when they build them along the wall, it's obviously it's for a high ground advantage. You know, it's be able to not just you be able to look down on your enemies, go after them have high ground, so that's maybe possible. Some, some scholars even suggest that they built this to try to protect themselves from the flood again, which is interesting because God said, I'm not going to do that. Which, if that's the case, that reveals something about their heart. 
Like they didn't trust God. They didn't believe him. Because even they talk about this idea that this tower is going to be with its top to the heavens. Now we're not sure if exactly if they're like trying to reach heaven. We're not sure on the on the figure of speech per se. But they are talking about it's going to be tall. It's going to be something big. Something that's going to get them. The, it's like and it's going to have a, have a stairway. It's a very prominent feature. A stairway to the gods, if you will. To go see them. To be up there to show them something. To do their own worship. Because obviously God didn't. You didn't see God come and like, hey, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to build a city. I want you to have a really high. I want you to build the account. They did. That, that was not part of the deal at all. But this is what they were deciding to do, to show their own self-reliance. Second, they were making a name for themselves. And the problem with this is when you're making a name for yourself, it's, it's about self-worship versus God-worship. Remember, take a look at Genesis 11, 4, 4 B again. Is then let us make a name for themselves. Which, you have to think about that. Who else in the world at that point would have any kind of reputation at all to be somebody that they would be worried about? They were the only ones there. Yeah. It's not like they were getting visitors from foreign countries elsewhere to like, Hey, you survived the flood too, so did we. No, none of that. They were the only ones. So there's only one person that they were, could compete with for a reputation. And that would be God. So they want to make a name for themselves. So it's kind of interesting during this time frame, because, uh, who, who was working in this time frame? And that was this guy named King Shulgi. Now you may say, I have never heard of King Shulgi. And that's okay. Neither had I. So, but at around this time, in his story, so this guy named King Shogi in this area of Ur was recorded with what he did with what's called the Ziggurat of Ur, and we're going to have pictures of that later. But he was very prominent in what he decided to do at this time. So they believed that who, it may, it may have been, this may have been another name for Nimrod. We don't know for sure. We don't know various names. A lot of these guys had multiple names. Let's take a look at King Shogi. Here he is. This is King Shogi. I love it. On this little steel right here, if you will. And he called himself, hmm, what did he call himself? Why didn't click it there, uh, for a while? Oh, go back. Let's see, I didn't have, oh, sorry. I thought I had my name there. Oh, there it is. I hit it one more time. There it is. This is what he called himself. The king of the four corners of the world. <laughs> or the king of the universe. <laughs> huh. That'd be mighty nice to build myself a tower and show how great I am, you know, just like and everybody's on board with it. It's kind of kind of awesome. And the next one is it talks about that he even had the stone carving is praising himself. That's always good. It's always you know nowadays a lot of people talk about writing a love letter to ourselves, you know, but that maybe that's all this was. He was just like, I'm the best king ever. Of all the kings that are ever living today, I'm the best. That's all I love with, with my kids. I my my oldest and uh, oldest son, middle daughter, and youngest son, and always like Matthew's the oldest. Says, of all my oldest sons, you're the best. <laughs> Manda's like uh, of all the daughters I have, you're the best. <laughs> and, I, and then Chris, of course, is my youngest son. He's the best. But there, that's all. Here's this guy. So they found this stuff where it's just like. Praising himself. So yeah, here it is. They're making a name for themselves. And this guy might have been one of the contributors. It's like, let's let's build up our reputation. Again, who are they impressing? There's nobody else around. They're only impressing themselves and trying to tell God. God, we don't need you. We don't need you. We, we're pretty impressive. Check us out. It's kind of interesting because when we think of later on as the aftermath of this and the people that lived through it, of course, right after that would have been Abram, who would have been called Abraham. <clears throat> right out the gate, when we see him leaving, just a second. <coughs> 
sorry. Uh, as they're leaving in the next chapter, God comes to Abraham and he says this in Genesis 12, verse 2 3. He says, I, that be God, will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I, I will curse and you will, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Which, of course, we know is Jesus, our Savior, who came through that line. But I love it. They're trying to make their name great. They're like, look at us, how great we are. But then God's like, <coughs> Abram, I want you to leave this group later on down the line. Because I will make your name great. I will do this. Not of your own effort. Not, in, you know, not like Abraham did a publicity tour or anything like that. You know, and he didn't have a great economic program. Like, check this out. I got the new world system here. And just, no, God says, I will make you third thing is very interesting is, is the anti-dispersal program that they're setting up here. This is the problem with this is that they're self-salvation. They're going to save themselves versus God's salvation. And of course the, this is, has to be you know, we can look at this and we're like this is so foolish so foolish to put this up and, and blasphemous in its own way. Building, they were, in a sense, building this city and this tower as a defense against God. <laughs> so, the last part of verse 11, chapter, or chap, verse 4, chapter 11, it says, Lest we, we're doing all these things, lest we be dispersed over the face of the earth, of the whole earth. Key word here is lest. So they... You ever ever do something and you know you're in trouble while you're doing it? You just know. You do it anyway. Because you think, well, oh, I can get away with it, or this will have no consequences, or whatever. Just like, but you don't. You know that you're doing something. And that's where I think this language is it's like they knew that they were pressing God's buttons here on purpose. Maybe on a dare. Like, we're going to do all this stuff, and what are you going to be able to do about it? Pushing his promises against him. I mean, we see that in Scripture, even like Paul, I was just reading in Romans, where Paul said, you know, they, they were accused. It was like, well, because we're under grace, you just, we can all just keep sinning even more under grace. He says, well, may it never be. But they were accused of that. And so here it is, they're like, well, God will never flood us again. So let's just, let's just do this. We'll show them how great we are. Person again, why would there be worries about them being dispersed? I mean, but that's the whole thing. They were told to go and get out there. Go out in the world and get busy. But they all stayed right there. And they did it out of self-preservation. When I think about, at this point, how many people were there... Remember I said, that maybe when they were started, about 200 people, at this juncture, they probably would have at least had just over 7,000 people in the time frame that they were there. Maybe even more, because I just did it conservative of like only four generations that could have had a little bit more. And at about like six kids per family in a generation. And that, again, could have been way more too. But there you go. So they would have had about that many people, about 7,700 or more people that are all there building the city, making it happen. I can't remember, let's see, so the anti-dispersal, I think I showed you the, the pictures of that. Did we show our pictures of the, the ziggurat of Ur already? In the, what do I got from the next one there? Yeah, there we go, ziggurat of Ur. So this is what they were building. There it is today, that is today of what they found because the bricks were so well preserved they were able to most of those are original bricks that they put back together now the bricks weren't labeled to like okay this brick goes here <laughs> no but they were able to use bricks and the reason they were able to do that is because throughout history other people had used their bricks 
Because when in early history, when the archaeologists were going over there, of course, when they found it, there was like one big mound of stuff. But they saw other mounds all around, in the distance, all around. And they're like, what's going on there? And they, were, they found the bricks. From there, everybody were stealing bricks throughout history to make other little villages and towns and everything else elsewhere. That's how long they last. Then they had a practical, they had a practical thing to do. But there it is. That's a, that, so that's today. You know, back at you know, thank you Saddam Hussein for being so motivated. And uh, but there it is. And they, they suggest it probably would have tried to look like this. But here's the deal. You'll notice that in the in the picture today that there's this looks like a pile of dirt on top. It's not a hill in back. It's a hill on top. What it what it gets at is that it, it was not completed. Because even when they found it, it was not complete. It was left undone. So the artist's rendition is like their best guess of what they were aiming for and, and what they were doing. But it was left undone. It was there because of the very thing that they wanted to not do is exactly what God did. And it's interesting that when Mary, Jesus' mom, was singing her song after meeting Elizabeth. She has her own commentary, even on this, of uh, this idea of what happened, even though she wasn't referencing them, but she was referencing proud people. Luke chapter 1, verse 50 through 52. And it says, His and his mercy, that would be God's mercy, is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. So here it is. That's, this is what he's doing. And that's what God does throughout the history. If you look at the, the term scattered, how often Israel gets scattered because they, they were all that in the bag of chips. God's like, no, I'm going to show you. Because human unity is human power. Truly is. No doubt. God's going to comment on that when he comes down and checks the, in, in his illustration of illusion of coming down. And I say not illusion, but illusion of what he was doing with an A. Human unity is human power. Otherwise, kings wouldn't pursue kingdoms. Let's face it. That's why in, in our government here and governments around the world, there is competition. Everybody's like, why can't we all get along? Because we can't decide who's going to be in charge. That's the key. Somebody's got to be in charge because we're still on this side of heaven. Jesus isn't here yet. And of course, what's interesting is when Jesus gets in charge, in the thousand year reign, when Jesus gets in charge, they don't like it when Jesus is in charge. They rebel against him again. That's us. So when people say, why can't we get along? It's because it's we. <laughs> it's us. That's, we are our own worst enemy. And these guys, I, I like what J. Vernon McGee said about this. And he said, God had said to man that he should scatter over the earth, replenish the earth, as he was told to do. The man in essence answered, nothing doing. We're not going to scatter. We're going to get together. And we're through with you, God. That's what they were doing. So that when we, when you read this story and you're like, gosh, God seemed awful upset about them just building a tower. There were a lot of reasons behind that tower that God's like, no. No, because they were becoming unified in godlessness. That's what the problem was. And God's like, come on, man. This isn't the way it is. It, it should be. That's why it's so important when... God speaks to Abraham. We don't know. Abraham, by all accounts, didn't know much. Maybe he, like I said, he had heard stories from one of maybe Noah's kids, Shem. Maybe he has heard stories about God. We don't know what their thoughts were about it. We just don't know. Of course, we know how this turns out. And that's the rub. That's the, that's the rub of all this. It's because, you know, we look at what's recorded about man's sinful inclination. And 
And we know that, how many of us know that when we sin, it'll hurt us? We know it. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop us. Our flesh will make up all sorts of cases to, to go ahead. Yes, just go ahead. They'll hurt you. But remember, the flesh never said they'll hurt you. Well, this will be great. And afterward, that's when the Spirit tells you the truth. And the Spirit says, you just inflicted pain upon yourself. And you're like, oh, man, why can't I remember? But that's the thing. Is we, we always think that it won't be us. That's why the danger here is when we read stories like this, we read about, we read about them and what they did. We're dangerously close to like that Pharisee that Jesus talked about at the temple where he's right next to the tax collector. And he says, oh, thank you, God, that I'm not like him. Mm -hmm. Of course, Jesus, the other guy's like, have mercy upon me, O oh Lord, a sinner. And Jesus said, it was that guy that went away justified. That's why the danger, that we got to look at this and just remember, just like, Lord... Lord, any moment this flesh could get away from me. It could. It could lead me, draw me off. Any moment now, the world could introduce some new scheme in my life that I'm just like, that's the thing I'm missing. There it is, the answer to all my problems. Any moment now, the enemy could whisper that lie that I've been wanting to hear. The devil never tells us lies that we don't want to hear. <laughs> That'd be a stupid lie. He's going to tell us the lie we, we, we want to hear. And then there it is. There we are. Rebelling against God. Just like that. And in our city, in our lives, are dispersed. I'm like, what just happened? God's like, well, you've got to remember, trust me. Not your flesh, not worldly schemes, definitely not the lies you want to hear. You have to trust God. Father God, we just thank you for your honest word. Thank you, Lord, for telling us this story, this history, and why, why it happened. Father, protect us. Protect our, protect our hearts, minds, from the lies of the flesh, lies of the world, lies of the enemy. Father God, help us trust you. We just ask this. By your power and by your great name. Amen. Let's praise the Lord.